believe we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination except we have been called by his name. Tonight's lesson, we're going to take what is called an apologetic view of water baptism. Apolog apologetic means, doesn't mean you're giving an apology like I'm sorry for it, okay? But what it means is, is you're, you're defending it to critics. So, so there, water baptism, all, all areas of the Bible have critics, okay? And water baptism certainly has its critics, particularly in the traditional denominations of today. Now, if you have not been in our study, then from the very first study on, what we have seen, we have, we have been endeavor, endeavoring just look at the Bible and see what it said first. So this is the, the final culmination of that. We first looked at Scripture, and in Scripture, it, there's no doubt that the only biblical model where anybody was baptized from the time of Christ on, okay, so after John the Baptist, but especially after Calvary and, and even before Calvary, was by full immersion in the name of Jesus. Uh, I mean, somebody orally invoking saying in the name of Jesus and by someone old enough to know what they were doing, okay? Uh, and that's in every case, whether it be the disciples in John 4 or whether it be in Acts 2, the Pentecost, or Acts 8 in Samaria, or Acts 10 with the householder Cornelius, or Acts 19, which we'll talk a little bit more tonight about John the Baptist's disciples being rebaptized, or uh, Ananias coming to Saul and Paul later telling about it in Acts 22, 16. So, and throughout Romans and Galatians, it's always by immersion by someone old enough, okay, to, to know what they're doing and always in the name of Jesus. Now, what happens is a lot of religious movements have different roots, okay? And in our church, what we're trying to be, I don't know if we're there yet, we're trying to be, we're trying to be a truly apostolic church. We believe that if anybody had their doctrine right, uh, James, John, Simon, Peter, the original people that walked, literally rubbed shoulders with Jesus and walked with him and were trained by him, we believe they had their doctrine right, okay? And so in our church, we're endeavoring to, to, go, to go back and, for lack of a better, better word, leapfrog backward or circumvent all this church history. I don't want to trace our stuff back to a reformer. I want to trace it back to Jesus and his apostles. And that's what we mean when we say apostolic. Now, some people use that term other ways, but that's what we mean, okay? So, a lot of different, depending on where your religion came from, a lot of, uh, depending on where your denomination came from, where it traces its roots, okay? Um, you, there are some ideals and doctrines that have been handed down as, as human tradition. And what happens is, we've talked about this, and I just kind of want to bring this back up because we're going to see some cases again tonight, that the way not to study the, the Bible is to say, I believe this over here. Now, I'm going to turn and look at the Bible, and I'm going to try to find verses that back up what I already believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. That is how not to study the Bible, because the Bible's a big book, and if you take stuff out of context and take it out of the time period in which it was written, and don't read what all before or after or try to get an understanding of what they were saying in the time, you can find any scripture to say anything you want to. I remember years ago at a youth camp, we had a guy got up, and he's reading a scripture in Ecclesiastes, and the first part of it uh, in the King James basically says something like, children, do as you wish, okay? And he read that and just kind of paused, and of course, at youth camp, junior high, we were all going, whoa, okay? But then, of course, you read the rest of the verse, it goes on to say, but you will answer to God for everything you do. <laughs> so, uh, just... Just looking for a fragment of a verse to find something you can do, you can find it, okay? And we were all cheering until we read the rest of the part, and then, of course, that kind of messed up the whole, uh, the whole rigmarole, okay? So that's how not to study Scripture, okay? But that's mainly what a lot of people do. I already believe this. I've been fed this. I've been told this. Now let's find Scripture to back up what I believe. And they, they, they start looking around the Scriptures. But the Bible, the Bible teaches in Isaiah 28, 10 through 11, and it's actually the name of the series, here a little and there a little, where I got that was the book of Isaiah, and he says that it shall be here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept or principle upon precept or principle. Y'all with me? Okay. So in other words, in Scripture, it, there's uh, on a subject, there's a little bit over here, there's a little bit over here, a little bit over here. But the Bible says in Psalms 119, the sum of your word is truth. So in other words, when you put it all together, 
you have, and you interpret, let scripture interpret scripture, you have God's interpretation. So the way we should study the Bible is say, forget what I already believe. Let's go read the scripture, all the subjects, put them together, and then let's see what God believes, okay? Uh, if we can find a scripture that contradicts what you believe, then obviously you, you probably just tried to find what we call a straw man argument looking into it, okay? And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of give some, we're going to give some, I'm going to bring up, I'm going to do something I rarely do. We're going to, I'm going to bring up what people say who do not believe that water baptism is essential for salvation or who do not encourage water baptism at all. I'm going to bring up the arguments that I have heard over the last, uh, well, 40 years, okay? And we're going to look at them scripturally to see if they have merit because we always want to listen to a critic just to give them a chance to see if maybe they have Right? And all criticism can sometimes have a, a, a nugget of truth in it, so let's, let's go back and look, okay? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So we've got to take this. Somebody say yeah. 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 And I don't want to, we're talking about salvation here. I don't want to ignore right. this at all, right? right. Does she have a Bible study? Yes. We did? Yes. Okay, we're good. Yeah, yeah we, you, don't, you don't want to leave Superwoman a hang in there. <laughs> oh, does she have a chair? That's the answer. All right. So, we've already talked about the exception clauses. What about the wild guy in Borneo and all that? So, we're not going to go back over that. We're doing new stuff, okay? So, I'm, I'm on page one. Everybody say yay. yay. And the first thing that we're going to discuss is, is water baptism a work, okay? And um, I was um, doing a call of nature one time in a, in a public restroom, okay? Uh, one time. It was just one of those things, facts of life. You have to go see those little rooms. And uh, with kids, you, you spend your entire life doing a tour of bathrooms. Uh, you don't know what anything else looks like, but you know what the bathroom looks like. And uh, there on the back of the toilet was a track, okay? Uh, like a little piece of religious propaganda or material. And uh, I picked it up and read it. Um, and I kept it, and I added it to this Bible study because it illustrated it perfectly. One argument that I hear sometime, and boldly in blood red lettering, the tract proclaimed, uh, water baptism is a work. I mean, in big letters. Everybody say big letters. Big letters. And the tract went on to quote the scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. Uh, we're going to let Sister Mary read because she's looking at me, making eye contact <laughs> at the wrong moment, I mean, the right moment. <laughs> Ephesians 2 and 8, go ahead. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of words, of works, so that no one may boast. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously we believe that, that scripture by saying amen. amen. But the track finished on the last page after that scripture by saying you don't need to be baptized to be saved. Because that is a work. And then, on the, when you flip over, the track says, say this prayer. And it led them in a sinner's prayer, like we've already discussed what our second week. It led them in a sinner's prayer and told them, because you have confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you have prayed this prayer of repentance, then you are saved. And, and in the bottom half parentheses, you don't need to be baptized. And so that, that, was, that was kind of the point of the track, okay? Now, the track is a little extreme. Most people aren't that, quite that extreme. Mm -hmm. But this, this is the logic and the reasoning that's most commonly used uh, against water baptism, okay? And it's kind of funny. If you think about it, let's pause before we got into that. Think about this, okay? Where, where did water baptism come from? Where, where did, uh, who, was it, who made it a part of the church? It was Jesus. It was Jesus who commanded it, Matthew 20 and 19, Mark 16 and 16. It was Jesus who took a Jewish rite where people and students would, uh, somebody's having a bad day, would, uh, would come under and, and be known and identified as a, as a, as a student of the, of the teacher, okay? And Jesus is the one who presented it, and Jesus' disciples whom he trained are the ones who began to preach it throughout all the earth. It's a very interesting stance to be a quote-unquote Christian church, which means Christ-like, and yet you have an agenda to attack something that Jesus championed. Um, the world attacks what we believe enough. Surely the church, I mean, if Jesus said something was important, then why would we seek to discredit it, okay? Um, and so that's just an interesting thing, okay? So um, let, let's, let's consider it. So the, the logic is we're saved by grace. Come on, read after me. Say we're saved by grace. Saved by saved by grace. grace. Therefore, uh, we don't have to do any action to be saved or any work like water baptism. And let, let's consider this line of thinking, okay? So I'm in the middle of page one. You're with me? Mm -hmm. Y'all ready? Yeah. So first of all, a quick glance back up to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Let's, let's finish the phrase, okay? 
we're not just saved by grace, but we're saved by grace through, through faith. faith. And that's the part they miss, okay? Right? Is that what it says? Go back and look. For by grace you have been saved. Say it with me. Say through, through faith. faith. Okay? The book of James teaches us that faith without action is dead. Okay? That, that faith requires obedience and an action to it, or it's really not faith at all. So faith is believing something so strongly that you act upon it even before you receive what, what you have believed for, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and what I want you to grasp is, is that ha faith being a part of the salvational process, which it is, by the way, uh, does not cheapen grace one bit, okay? If I were to say, if I were to say, uh, Brother Murphy, I have a thousand dollars I want to give you, um, his immediate answer would be, okay, <laughs> but the problem is, okay, he, 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 no, his, his, his answer would be why? Okay, like, like, yeah, what's the kid? I, I know him well enough. He'd be like, what, what, what do you want? What's the deal? Okay. And if I said there's no catch, it's just grace. It's unmerited favor, which is what grace means. I'm just giving it to you out of the bottom of my heart. It's not because you're good looking. It's not because you're kind. It's not because you've earned it. Uh, I didn't say he wasn't good looking. I just said it wasn't because of that. So y'all are reading into it. Okay. Uh, it's not because you've done work for me. You've done something for me. It's just because. It's because it's unmerited favor, right? right? Okay. But there's a catch. I don't have it on me. It's in the bank. So if you'll meet me at Security Service Federal Credit Union, okay, where that thousand dollars is, and I do have a thousand dollars in Security Service Federal Credit Union, okay, um, I think a thousand. <laughs> um, if you'll meet me tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, uh, I'll get it out and you'll have it, okay. Now, how dumb would it be for him to say, no, if I got to show up at the bank. I gotta get up at 9 a.m. I thought you were gonna give it to me for free. Okay? It's still free, okay? Just because it requires a little action on his part according to my direction to get it and obedience to what I said, right? Doesn't mean that it's not grace, that it's not unmerited favor. He's still getting a thousand dollars, okay? So we need to understand salvation is by grace. But what that means is, is we don't deserve it. That God does not, God does not owe it to us. But that was unmerited favor for God to be able to give us a plan of salvation. Does that make sense? Yes. However. He's God, it's his heaven, it's his universe, we're his creation. So he can put any stipulation on it he wants, okay? And he had to do it in a way that fulfills his holy law, okay? Which demanded blood sacrifice, which brings about Calvary and all these things, okay? But we got to understand it's by grace if you've been saved through faith, okay? So our salvation comes through faith, and again... Faith is something that you have to act upon. Let me, let, me, let me take a little example, okay? And maybe this is kind of potato head style teaching, but the world needs this because they're not hearing it in a lot of mainstream churches, okay? Uh, Genesis 6 and 8, this, in this case, uh, which way do we want to go? Do we want to go to Sister Joanne? We'll go to Sister Joanne. She's paying attention in Lizzie's talk. So we'll <laughs> but Noah found the grace in the eyes of the Lord. All right, everybody say Noah. 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 Remember Noah? Noah's dude built the big boat, right? Okay. So uh, Noah found grace. How many believe that? And yes. what he means is, is Noah found unmerited favor in the Lord. Noah, right. Noah wasn't saved because he was perfect, okay? But he was a whole lot more godly than other people, right. okay? But basically, God didn't owe anything to Noah. God just decided to give Noah a chance of salvation. Everybody say yay? Okay. And so, was Noah saved by grace? Absolutely. God came down, talked to him. God, it was unmerited favor that God warned him the flood was coming. It was unmerited favor that God would give him uh, uh, a blueprint of a boat that would, that would, or a raft, if you really want to get down to it, a big barge that would, that would weather the storm in the right dimensions, right? Okay? Uh, people always said the Titanic was built by professionals and, and uh, the ark was built by just one man following God's blueprints. You know, you know, you know which one stayed up, right? Which one stayed up. So, um, so it was absolutely unmerited favor. It was grace that Noah found for God giving him that thing. Now, what if, though, what if Noah would have said, okay, well, I have to, like, build the ark? I have to build it? I have to spend, I don't know, three, four hundred years building this sucker? What kind of grace is that? Thanks, God. Okay. Well, the rain still would have come. Judgment still would have come on the earth, and Noah would have been wishing he'd have put a little action and faith to what God had said. Okay. So as it was the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, we're saved by grace, but God has put, given us a blueprint of things we need to obey in order to be saved. Right. Yes. By grace, through faith, 
you've got to act upon what God, God's word has said, okay? Right. And, and the Bible says that Noah found grace, but the Bible also says that Noah moved by faith. We're in Hebrews 11 and 7. Uh, go ahead, brother. By faith, Noah was born about things not yet seen, and holy fear must have heart to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Okay, so Noah was saved by the grace of God and the fact that God gave him the favor to have to know the destruction was coming to have a plan in place, but he was also saved by faith because he, he, he did what God told him to do, right. obeyed what God told him to do. Are you ready for this? Followed precisely the blueprint and did it how God told him to do. He wasn't like, you know, that's really tough to put the joint together that way. Let's just cut a little corner here. You know, I think that's kind of dumb, you know. Or let's or let's add something to it. Let's install a water slide on the back, okay? If he'd have done that, okay, he wouldn't have. You see what I'm saying? He was saved by faith in God that God knew what was best by doing exactly what God told him to do per God's instructions. Now, now let's pause here for a moment because we're using a little extended metaphor here, and I'm going to move fast in a minute, okay? Are y'all with me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Y'all are very intently listening. I mean, y'all are like, yes. okay, um, which is good. I'm just not quite used to that. Uh, used to at least somebody being distracted. Um, well, we could. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now, what if Noah would have made up his own plan? What if Noah would have heard what the blueprints of God and be like, that's, that takes a lot of work. That's a lot of that's a lot of years. You know, I, I'd rather just play and and you know and build it out of straw. I mean, I'm gonna start to turn Noah into three little pigs. But uh, what if uh, I think I'm I think I could do like a a little skate pod. Be better for me and the wife, and let the Some kids do for themselves. Or, I'm making this up, okay? Or, I, who, who wants to be with a closed roof with all those animals? You ever thought about that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Some people get mad at because of the church. I may have a couple skunks, but it's the only thing going. You better get on the ark, right? Okay, a few snakes. Right? Standard, standard joke alert, okay? Noah walks around the corner and sees his son fishing, right? And he's like, "What are you doing, fool? We only have two worms." Right? <laughs> it's, it's a rough crowd tonight. I'll leave it alone. Now, that's a joke. Why is that Why is that a joke? Why is that not biblically accurate? Because there was a cover on the ark. Right. Right. The way he opened one window was straight up, and when it started raining, he closed that baby very, very solid, very fast. Okay? So maybe he says, I want to open into design. I, I want to have a sun deck, and I want to have, okay? What if he had begun to do his own design or his own invention? Okay? Well, that would have been trying to save himself by his works. Right? Right? But when he builds the ark according to God's blueprints, it's not salvation by works. It's salvation by obedience. Right. Right. You grasp yeah. what I'm saying here? Yeah. So the analogy <laughs> still applies. Where did water baptism come from? Okay. I want you to grasp something. I personally, okay, could care less either way about water baptism. I didn't invent it. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Okay. Now it's important to me because I want to follow God's blueprint. But as far as me personally, it's not a personal slight to me for someone not to get baptized in water. Right. But who's it a slight to? Who came up with water baptism? Jesus, Jesus came up with water baptism. Right. The Bible, it's a biblical concept, okay? And so if water baptism was something that a pope dreamed of, or something that a preacher dreamed of, or something that I had dreamed of, or uh and I'm a preacher, but I'm not a poet. Uh, something that uh, man or woman had made up on their own to try to invent, that would absolutely be a work. But the issue is water baptism is a commandment. Right. Okay. Peter ordered them, according to Acts 10 and 48, right. he ordered them, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Yep. Jesus commanded his disciples, go and teach them, okay, commanding them, okay? To observe all things like I've shown you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which we know is Jesus. Right. So, so you grasp, it's a commandment. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Okay, Mark 16, 16. So it's a part of the plan of salvation that God in his grace has presented to mankind. It's God's grace that we have a blueprint that we can be saved by. Right. And so like Noah building the ark, it's foolish to label it a work. Because it's not salvation by work, it's salvation by obedience, okay? And here, here it is. Here's, here's, the, here's kind of the final straw on that, okay? The problem with people who view water baptism like that tract that we mentioned is that their theology contradicts itself. Yes. Because that tract said that, that you don't have to do anything to be saved. Right. Right. Water baptism, you don't have to take any action. The, the, their problem with water baptism was that you don't have to take an action to be saved because we're saved by grace. If you have to do something to be saved, it's not grace. And then on the back page, it leaves them in a sinner's prayer. Right. Right. Yeah. But that's an action. Yes. You, you with me? 
Exactly. And in the scriptures, in the Bible, we never, one time, never have anybody no. leading anybody in sinner's prayer. No. But we have dozens of examples of the apostles baptizing and commanding people to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, are, do you, are you like the Jehovah's Witness? Do you believe everybody's saved no matter what? Because <laughs> Jesus Christ died? No. no you, the Bible doesn't say everybody's going to be saved. Broad is the way. Wide is the gate that leads you to destruction. <laughs> and many find that. And Jesus says, straight is the way, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. What does that mean? That means not everybody's going to be saved, okay? Right. Jesus Christ died for all, yes. but not all have taken a part, just as the ark would have held a lot more than eight people, but only eight people actually followed the blueprint and got on. Are you with me here? Yes. Okay. Uh, people, and I've heard people say, well, what happened if the ark had been filled? Well, they had time to figure it up. They could have yep. built another one. Yes. Yeah. How come they only built one? Right. You follow what I'm saying? So, I mean, he gave them hundreds of years warning and, and, and deal if they had believed the preaching of Noah. So, so we, we can't say, well, well, you don't have to do anything to be saved. You have to do something. Well, if you have to do something, then what do you have to do? What the Bible says. Right. So when you do something like believing in Jesus, yeah. repenting of your sins, being baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, living a holy life, it's not salvation by works. It's salvation by obedience. Right. Mm -hmm. You cannot divorce obedience from salvation. Right. And there's no error. Or that divorce that, including grace. Everybody say yay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, only they, only those who truly believe obey, and only those who obey truly believe. Okay. So if somebody says, well, I believe, but I'm not going to obey what the Bible tells me to do. But I believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, why don't you do what he tells you to do? That, that, that doesn't even make sense. Right. Y'all grasp what I'm saying? All right. So let's move forward a little bit next. Okay. So the next, the next deal is... We're saved, she okay? We're saved by grace through faith. Little one's not feeling well tonight. Jesus' name, I've had to pray for a while ago. Her too. Jesus' name, touch the whole Copus family. Bless the little, bless the little angels. <clears throat> Let their halos go back up to the top. They're sagging. They're little sagging halos. So we're by grace through faith, okay? So you, you can't use that argument to do, dispel something the Bible clearly commands. Right. Uh, or else you get into a state where you, nobody's doing anything to be safe. So why are you leaving a track in the bathroom? Right. <laughs> right. right. Why so waste the money? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go give it to the poor. Help the dude on, you know, Calabra and whatever. Okay, so anyway. All right. So, all right. Let's move on. Everybody with me? Yeah. So now we're talking, it's an apologetic view of water baptism. So now we're going toward water baptism as a public confession, okay? Some denominations, realizing a little bit the importance of water baptism in the scriptures, still try to mix it with a grace only doctrine. That's their term, by the way, grace only. And they try to compromise by, by making water baptism as something you should do, but it's not absolutely necessary for salvation, okay? And basically, this is the equivalent of standing on one side of the fence and on the other and trying to please everybody at the same time. And all you ever do is tick God off of that, but that's another, that's another <laughs> message for another time, okay? Um, and usually their line of reasoning goes something like this. Now, not, not all of them have all these elements. I'm just going to throw out stuff that I've heard, okay? Okay. Um, one is you are. I'm on page two. You are saved by confessing Christ as your personal Savior and accepting Him in your life. But since Christ commanded you to be baptized, you should be baptized as a public confession, or sometimes they will say a public profession of your faith. Okay, uh, you'll hear this term. This is not in your note. You'll hear people say we have believers baptism. Yes. Okay. Uh, once every three months, once a quarter, you know, uh, it's the fall believers baptism. All the believers who have professed Christ, but you've never been baptized, you really should do this because Jesus Christ told you that you should. And so you've already received Christ. It really isn't necessary, but we want, we believe that you need to profess your faith to the masses. And so on, I'm making this up, on October the 32nd, we're going to have... And it wouldn't be October 32nd in our church uh, or the 12th of November. We have, believers uh, we have believers' baptism, and everybody can line up and whatever. You say, well, why are you joking? Well, to me, that's unscriptural, okay? And we'll get to a line in just a minute, okay? That the disciples baptized people immediately and commanded it instantly. They taught it as imperative, not as something you wait till the next quarter to do, okay? Um, another way you'll hear it uh, is they'll say, uh, water baptism not what saves you. Your simple or verbal belief has already saved you, but you are being baptized to indicate publicly to all that you believe, okay? Uh, this is important because we need to let our light shine before men, okay? And sometimes, not always, some people will say, uh, 
not all churches, but some, some churches do, so I want to mention this. They'll say, well, being baptized is a public way of joining our assembly. Okay. And so there are some pastors in some churches, uh, even in Pentecostal circles, that if you move from another church, you move from, I don't know, Pasadena to Castorville, yet you have to be baptized in that church as a public showing of that you're baptized in the church family, okay? And this logic is so common. There's so, I mean, there are zillions of preachers in churches that teach some derivative of this, okay? Even Pentecostal preachers. Um, it almost seems right, okay? The only problem with it is, okay, and again, okay, just a teeny weeny little problem, okay, as I spit on you. Um, <laughs> okay? The only problem with that is, is it never in scripture one time did an apostle or anybody look at somebody and say, you need to be baptized as a public profession of your faith. Right. Um, or as a public confession, testimony of your already belief. You never see that ever, okay? In fact, in the testimonies or in the recorded times where people were baptized in scripture, there are several cases that contradict everything we just said, okay? Um, uh, and, and so again, Throughout the Bible, people got baptized as a result of their faith in Christ. I believe believing in Christ, I believe confessing it is important. I believe that you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah. We believe that's the first step, just not the only step according to Scripture, okay? It is the first step. He that, Mark 16 and 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So belief is a prerequisite, right, right to, to water baptism, okay? Um, and, and, and so the scriptures do not present it as a public showing forth of something that's already happened, but like first Peter three and 20 baptism does now save us. And he's using Noah as an example. Okay. Um, uh, Acts 22, 16, uh, be baptized, washing away your sins. Okay. So the Bible is washing away your sins or salvation as a reason to get baptized in water. Not as a public profession of a salvation you've already achieved. You guys with me? Yeah. Okay. Look on the bottom of page two. I have a little list for you. Okay. And I know I'm doing a lot of talking in this Bible study, and I, and I apologize. But you see, mm -hmm. the problem is, is we're talking about people's beliefs that aren't in Scripture. Right. So I can't read Scripture about things that aren't scriptural. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you do read the Bible, uh, you will find. I want you to think about these. And this is not all the baptisms of Scripture, but this is four of them that I want to point out. Okay. Uh, Acts 8, 25 through 40, uh, Philip goes off in the desert and baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. Have you ever read that? Yes. You can read it on your own time. Acts, the entire chapter of 10, if you want to get down to the good stuff, skip down to the end of it. Uh, Peter baptizes all of Cornelius' family. Very important. He's an Italian man, a non-Jewish person. That's, that's why we're here today. Acts 16, 33, Paul baptizes the Philippian jailer and his family. Okay. Um, after being in prison and God let the, the original jailhouse rock and uh, <laughs> they were loosed and he converted the whole jailer and his family. And then Acts 19, 1 through 7, something we'll come back to in a minute. Paul rebaptized the disciples of John the Baptist. They, as, as disciples of John the Baptist, they had been baptized once. He rebaptized the name of Jesus. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, here's the deal. All four instances of those have some element that contradict the common belief today that water baptism is to show forth your faith publicly or to publicly join a church, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, let me give you an example, okay? Each one has one element that contradicts that. For example, Philip baptizing the Ethiopian unit. They're in the middle of the desert. Nobody else. There's nobody else around. <laughs> Philip was the only member of the apostolic church there. Right. Okay? If it was a public profession of his faith, why is it valid in the middle of nowhere that Philip all has to tell about it later? You grasp what I'm saying there? Okay? In, in Acts chapter 10, uh, Cornelius' family had just received the gift of the Holy Spirit with the outward evidence of speaking other tongues, which was a definite sign to the Jewish people or the circumcised who came with Peter, according to Acts 10, 46, that, that they had received God's Spirit, okay? And they had believed, they just received a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and yet in Acts 10, 48, Peter still commanded, he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Right. If just having a public display of your faith is all that's needed, why does he command them to get baptized? Yes. And again... Again, it, it's, it, it begs the question, there wasn't a whole lot of members of the church there, okay, just Peter and some friends, okay? When Paul baptized the jailer and his family in Acts 16, 33, that's the whole story. The, the jailhouse rock didn't happen until Paul and his friend Silas sang at midnight, okay? And after it all come up, the jailer was going to commit suicide, and Paul says, hey, we're all here. It's a miracle. We know this is a supernatural thing. 
It's okay, you don't have to commit suicide because the Romans would have put him to death. And he takes them in their house and binds their wounds and then baptizes them that very, that very hour. We don't know what hour that was. Mm -hmm. It was probably at least 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning right. if, if they didn't sing until minute. Are y'all with me here? Right. Right. You grasp right. what I'm saying? Okay. And there was nobody else around except Paul and Silas. Right. Lydia and her family and all the church in her house were not around. Right. If, if, if water baptism is a public profession of your faith, then how is it valid to baptize somebody at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with no other church members around? Right. And why was it so important that despite his wounds, the apostle Paul would say, you need to do it now. Let's do it now. Right. 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 You grasp what I'm saying? Right. Yes. I've baptized people um, after Tuesday night Bible studies. Um, I baptized people who didn't want people around, okay, um, because, he, because he wanted to uh, surprise his wife. And boy, did he ever surprise his wife. Shocked her to death. That Sunday morning, walked in our church. She's like, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm just coming to church today. Oh, okay. Then when I announced it, she says, when? And then started crying. It was a great, it was a great moment. But um, I baptized people at 3 in the morning after having a flushing party. Not him. Okay. And we went home and took their drugs and flushed them down the toilet. Okay. In, in retrospect, I realized that was not wise because I was there with the drugs. But at the time, I was a young pastor and I was zealous. Okay. I, I've never done drugs, so I had to back off. I deserted. Uh, uh, so... Um, so all these things, the disciples of John the Baptist that Paul met in the 19th chapter of Acts, they'd already been baptized publicly under John the Baptist's ministry. Mm -hmm. They were baptized in front of the multitudes. Right. But they need to be re-baptized because they had been baptized in the name of Jesus, yeah. not because it was a public profession. Okay, right. So teaching water baptism as a public profession of faith only is a convenient way to straddle the fence. To say, well, we're not really going to attack something Jesus did, but we really don't believe it's necessary for salvation either. Okay? Again, okay, if a person is really moved on by Lord, we baptize them then and there. Okay? We don't wait till a believer's baptism where we do mass baptisms. We run you fresh water. <laughs> um, and we'll do it in the middle of the night. We'll, we'll do it whenever, okay? Because that's the biblical, that's the biblical method. I've baptized people um, from New Jersey in my swimming pool. And it's not a big swimming pool. It's like 15 foot around and about 4 foot deep. And it's on a slope, so it's actually about 2 foot deep and about 6 <laughs> foot deep. Okay? And we were all fully clothed, thank God, and uh, we got out there and baptized them. And my neighbors, who are another faith, they, they, were, they saw it and were asking questions about it. It's, it's a cool thing, middle of the night. 9, 10 o'clock at night after a Bible study, they want to get baptized. I was like, well, we go to church and wait. We got water in the in the pool. And I've been getting all the bugs out. You can over there. Okay? All right? So it, it, the, script, the scripture doesn't support that. We have to be careful when our personal religious beliefs do not match scripture and especially the apostles' doctrine. Okay? All right? Let's move forward. As promised, we finally got there, sister, so we're, we're there. Okay? Let's talk about sprinkling and infant baptism. Okay? Um, some denominations, such as the Roman Catholic Church and its closer offshoots, uh, teach water baptism as essential for salvation, but they deviate from the scriptural model in some way. Uh, most often, we talked about this last week, they deviate by baptizing without saying in the name of Jesus. We discussed that last week, so we're not going back over that. But another common deviation is that they sprinkle, okay? So rather than... Rather than, <laughs> she knows me too well. She took her glasses off immediately. Rather than, rather than put them all the way underwater or go to a river, they, uh, they, it's kind of cold. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's ice water. It was good. They, uh, it was good. All right. Um, they sprinkle, okay? Um, and they have various ways of doing it, okay? Uh, and the other thing that goes along with sprinkling, some, some they baptize infants, okay? They'll christen a, a baby, okay, which means they name it according to the church. And this is Roman Catholicism and other denominations, not just Roman Catholicism. There are some Episcopal that do the same thing, okay, and some Presbyterian churches and some modern evangelical churches. So I'm not just picking on Roman Catholics. But, uh, they, and they sprinkle the baby, okay? And um, as we learned last week in our, in our deal, we, we went through that whole tradition of what people have believed in baptism. It's very interesting. I want you to grasp this, okay, that... Infant baptism came first, then came sprinkling. Right. Mm -hmm. When they begin to baptize infants, it's very messy <laughs> to submerge infants. It can be dangerous. Okay? They usually survive. 
I guarantee you they were screaming like a mug. I mean, mine would have been okay. Well, I know, okay? But it's just a messy thing, okay? So as a convenience, they started sprinkling, came out of it, because it was a convenience, okay? Here, here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that, okay? And then, okay, then because they were baptizing, say, an infant baptism was battle sprinkling, then if somebody's on their deathbed, they can sprinkle them. Then it just got to be, well, it's just a whole lot easier than to have a baptistry and maintain it, have people change clothes and do the whole modesty thing and go through the whole process. It's just real convenient just to sprinkle everybody, and that's where it came from, okay? Um, um, so, um, and, and there are parts, believe it or not, the Roman Catholic Church, I'm not picking on the other, but let me just point out a couple of things. Roman Catholic Church still officially, by the book, sanctions immersion as, as a valid baptism. But it also it also sanctions sprinkling. So it's just a lot more convenient so they're all sprinkling. Y'all with me here? Yes. Now, let's dive off on a couple of things. You guys with me tonight? Yeah. How many of you learned something tonight so far? You learned something? Okay. Now, we're going to come back to some things we talked about last week, but we're, this, we're kind of going new, new territory tonight. Trying to trying to move forward, and then we're going to go a whole different direction next week, and then a whole other direction the next week after that. Okay, um, so the first thing, sometimes even among Pentecostal, even among spirit filled, even among spirit filled apostolic Pentecostals, okay, okay, even among people in our church. I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, there are people who have some weird beliefs about baptism. So let's let's talk about some things. First thing is. The Bible does not teach. Everybody say it does not teach. Does not teach. What, what scholars call baptismal regeneration. Okay? And what I mean when I say, what I mean when I say baptismal regeneration, it's not the water and it's not the act of baptism that brings forgiveness of sins. It's the God in heaven who forgives and washes those sins away in response to obedient faith to his word. Right. Okay? And, and, and you say, well, say, well, you're having it both ways. No, it's a big difference, okay? And then one is superstitious. The other is saying it's the obedience that makes the difference, right. okay? And as long as the obedience to the parameters in God's word are fulfilled, God does it no matter if all the other parameters are changed, okay? Right. So let me give you an example, okay? We talked about Naaman last week. Naaman, the Syrian general, who went to the prophet, kind of if you remember, and he wanted to be healed of leprosy, which is always a type or shadow of sin. And, and what, did, what, did, uh, what did Elijah tell him to do? Or Elisha, excuse me, Elisha told him to go wash yourself seven times, dip yourself, I mean, dip yourself totally in the Jordan River seven times. He gets all mad. He wants to, he's like, I think of five other rivers in Syria that are better than that muddy Jordan water, you know? I can think of a thousand other things he could have said to do, yeah. But here's the deal, okay? The only thing that's going to get the miracle is obedience. Right. So it wasn't that God sent an angel to stir up the waters of Jordan. Right. It wasn't that the waters of Jordan were special. It was, Naaman, will you just simply obey precisely exactly what I told you to do? Right. And when he dipped six times, no. Nothing happened. But when he dipped the seventh time, mm -hmm. when he came up, he was clean. I mean, believe it. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So it's obedience to God's word that does the work, okay? It's not the water, people, okay? Our water is uh, whatever it is from the county, whatever whatever it is, uh, from Medina Electric Co-op. So where is that at? Is that <laughs> I don't know where the water comes from. Edwards Aquifer Water. Edwards Aquifer Water, okay? okay? Yeah, I mean, it would be expensive if we only baptize them in Fuji water. <laughs> yeah. Biggest rip off in the world. That tastes any different. Uh, I just get the Fuji water bottle and refill it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so... Okay, but what I'm saying is, it's, we just run the water. It's ordinary water, okay? It's not the robe that I wear, because frankly, I don't wear a robe. Right. It's not the detachable collar that I wear, okay? I baptize people, and they're like, where's your robe? And I was like, <laughs> I don't even have a robe in my bedroom. Okay? Sorry for the imagery there. I have pajama pants I put on, like a few on it, and a t-shirt. That's what I sleep in. This just got real. Let's go back to the Bible. If you really must know, they're blue plaid pajama pants. They go down to my ankles. They're, they're perfectly fine. If I check my mail. Most of you, I look better than most people at Walmart. <laughs> Back to the Bible study. Um, okay, all right. I don't have a robe. What do you mean a robe? Well, I thought you were supposed to have a robe. Well, you're supposed. where's your collar? Well, I took my tie off because I got tired of dry cleaning my ties when they fall in the water. I took my watch off because I did that one time with a non-waterproof watch. And the baptism cost me about... 
you know, $5 I paid for the watch. <laughs> so, right? Okay, I mean, I'm being funny, but you grasp what I'm trying to say here. Doesn't matter if it's running water or not. Doesn't matter if the water is fresh or not. Doesn't matter if it's warm or not. Exactly. Okay? Because our hot water heater had failed and she got baptized in like, I don't know, the end of October, November, in like about 40 degree weather and it was cold. She had stammering lips. It had nothing to do with the Holy Ghost whatsoever. It was cold. Okay? Okay? Listen to me. It doesn't have anything to do with my faith at all. It has to do with your faith. He that believes in his baptized shall be saved. Is that what we hear? Okay? Uh, we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. It's not the superstitious act of a certain elements that come together. It's obedience to God's word. Word. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can wash away sins, which is equated with baptism, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. He applies spiritually, but we have to do the act of obedience. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and so, uh, and we're going to get to it in a minute, it's not the person baptizing you that makes it valid. It's the faith of the one who is being baptized. Okay. And so we quote the scripture all the time, but let's read it and let's quote the whole thing. Okay. In other words, I typically quote the first phrase, but let's actually read the whole thing. We're in Mark 16, 16. Where are we at? Uh, Sheriff, sure. go ahead. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, so Jesus, according to Jesus, and this is pretty good stuff, um, uh, believing is a prerequisite to a person being baptized, okay? And it's notable, I want you to understand that if you read the whole thing out, okay, he says whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, he will say, well, he didn't say whoever does not believe and is not baptized. He doesn't address someone who does not believe and is not baptized because they're synonymous. Okay, only a person who really believes God obeys what God tells them, and only a person who obeys what God tells them really believed. So if they refuse to get baptized, they don't really believe. Amen. Some people say, well, I believe. I believe Jesus. I believe the Bible, but I'm not getting baptized. <laughs> you don't really believe it. Okay? You grasp what I'm saying there? I mean, that, that's a faulty logic kind of thing, okay? It's, okay, right? It's a, it's I love you, but I won't marry you. What? Okay. So Exactly. Okay. So infant baptism is invalid for this reason. An infant cannot is not at an old enough age where they can believe for themselves. Right. Y'all with me? Okay. In scripture, in Jesus' ministry, okay, my faith can be valid for your physical healing. Right. There are people that are healed because of they're a servant healed because of his master's faith in coming to Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's a child healed because of daddy's faith coming to Jesus. Yes. Physical healing. But there's never anybody saved or forgiven based upon somebody else's faith. Right. Right. Amen. Yes. You with me? Yes. I can't believe for you, Tom. Sorry. I can't be baptized. I can't live righteously enough to save you. Okay? Because I'm not Jesus. That would make me Jesus. And um, I can just tell you I'm not Jesus. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. Okay? So, right? Y'all see what I'm saying here? Okay? So, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Okay? So, okay? We believe in full immersion. We believe I'm, pre you believe I'm a preacher. Okay? I'm an ordained minister with a religious organization. I've been a full-time minister. I was 20 years old. Um, we know how to do it in the name of Jesus. So, I go down to the pool in Castorville in June, right? They're jumping off the diving board. There's a boatload of them out there. Okay? People don't even know. And what if I go, Jesus' name! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Jesus name <laughs> Jesus name ooh wow okay right and I come back man I post man we had 630 <laughs> baptisms Saturday morning woo couple of repeats okay <laughs> why is that not valid why is that not valid they don't believe they don't we got water they went all the way under I'm a preacher I said in Jesus name now the preacher is not necessary we talked about that last week but I mean all these things that we think about baptism are in place I said the name I orally invoked they were fully submerged okay right I'm excited I'm counting up on Facebook or whatever okay the problem is they don't have faith for themselves he that believes if that's not valid neither is the infant baptism right right right, right. right. because the infant doesn't his mind's not developed enough in order to do it right. are y'all with me here okay and this explains why in scripture infants are never baptized we never one time in all of scripture never ever ever never never ever never never Find an example, as I spit on you, um, of, a, of an infant being baptized. Why? Because for baptism to be valid and potent according to the teachings of Jesus, you've got to believe first. Yes. Okay? Amen. And you've got to have faith. That's why when a kid comes to us and wants to get baptized, okay, be honest with you, okay, 
and we have kids of different ages. Now, I believe if they're old enough to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they're definitely old enough to get baptized. Right. Yet, I ask them, why do you want to get baptized? Yes. I go, tell me, you know, Pastor, I want to get baptized. Okay, that's sweet. Okay, <laughs> why do you want to get baptized? Okay? And if they can tell me why, even in general terms, mm -hmm. absolutely we'll do it. But they're like, Oh, I don't know, because Susie got baptized. No. Right. You want me to wait a little while, you talk to your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. We put them off. Why? They've got to be able to believe. I, it's not my, my faith. Right? Okay? And I'll just say this. Don't put down on children's baptism. Yes. I was baptized when I was eight. My wife's baptized when I was seven, and it's stuck. Right. We're more on fire right. for God today at 40 than we were today. Okay? Right. But we knew, because being a random pastor and being on these Bible studies in our home, we knew we knew why we were doing it, okay? Right. So don't put down on that, but we also want to make sure they know, okay? All right. Now, the other thing is, according to Acts 2.38, repentance, true repentance, is a prerequisite to water baptism, okay? Water baptism only washes away the sins. That's Acts 22.16. Uh, that have been repented of. You've got you to confess those sins for them to be repented of, in the, even in the future. Right. Okay? So, if a baptism is not a valid scriptural pra practice, but neither is cases where adults were baptized for social reasons only. Well, I got baptized. Why? Well, they wouldn't marry me. To my, they wouldn't marry my wife in the church unless I did. Right. That's not a reason to get baptized. Right. Right? right? Well, the only way I could join the hyphen youth group was, okay, that's not a reason. Right. When I go to camp, as a camp counselor, was to, that's not a reason. Right. Everybody else was doing it. That's not a reason. Right. And looking back, growing up in a pretty large church, it's about a 400 member church, okay? And there's a lot of us, we had a pretty good revival. We all got baptized. There were some of my friends that. There were some people that obviously did it just because everybody else was doing it. Right. Because they're sure not living a repentant lifestyle today. Right. And I love you, and if you hear that on SoundCloud, you need you know what I'm talking about. Don't be mad at me. Don't send me hate mail. Okay? So, um, you know, you got to be, for a person to a person must believe in Christ, they must repent of their sins, and do it to obey Scripture. Somebody say, yay. Yeah. If they did it for social reasons, then re, uh, rebaptism is advisable. We have somebody in our church right now whom I baptized in our early years of ministry. They came back later, okay? And that person came to me one night, you know, on the side and just said, hey, I'd like to get rebaptized. I said, why? He said, because years ago I was just doing it to get everybody's pressure. Everybody was pressuring me. All my friends, it was, it was peer pressure. And I said, let's do it. It ain't going to hurt you. Right. It just might help you because it might actually be obedience to the word of God. Because right. we don't believe in baptismal regeneration. It's not the fact. It's not a holy water. Yes. Right. It's right. not how right. we did it. It's your faith believing right. in your obedience. Amen. Y'all believe that? Yes. Okay. Amen. So again, we talked about the concept of sprinkling instead of immersion was never used until the Catholic Church began to sanction the baptism of infants because it was so convenient. Um, they, it became the most common form of baptism of Catholicism and its closest offshoots. So you have a picture there. That's members of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is a side branch of the Roman Catholic Church in <coughs> Russia. Okay? Uh, and um, the Roman Catholic Church, of course, holds that, that baptism by immersion is valid, but immersion is also the Russian Orthodox Church does not believe in sprinkling. No. Okay? And um, they're, they are, if you will look in that picture, Below that dude is, is in Russia, yeah. northern Russia, Russia, standing on ice. Russia. They broke the ice to baptize them people oh. because they also believe you got to be baptized outside. Okay, now let me just say this, okay? They're probably not doing it in Jesus. I, I, really, I really don't know, to be honest with you, so I'm not going to, let me just back off of that statement, okay? I really don't, I need to, I mean, I don't know, okay? My brother's pastor some people, he's one from the Russian Orthodox Church, and I should know that, but I don't, okay? But if they can go break ice, for tradition's sake, in Moscow, come on, somebody. Oh, we did here. <laughs> it wasn't ice. It wasn't that, okay? All right. So I'm on top of page four. You guys with me? Yes. Sprinkling for baptism is never found in Scripture. The very Greek word for baptism means baptizo means to completely immerse or to bury. Somebody say yay? Yay. The one Scripture... Yet some denominations try to twist to, produce, to prove the validity of sprinkling is this. If you go to a family bookstore, family Christian bookstore, and you want to get a sprinkling plaque, okay, uh, that they exist, okay, some of you are laughing. That is just outright real. I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, it'll have Exodus 24 and 6, and that's actually where I got the scripture because I wanted to see what scripture they, would you put on it, okay? Um, and it's this, Exodus 24, 6. We are over here. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do, and be obedient. 
And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Okay, so this is when the law was initiated, the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. uh, he took the blood from the sacrificial lamb, he sprinkled it on the book and on the people, okay, which is kind of nasty to think about it. Um, and uh, he said, this is the blood of the covenant. And they say, well, you know, baptism is a covenant, which we agree. Baptism is the application of God's will, which we agree. Okay, but, okay, this is a bad, this is a bad scripture because... If this scripture proves anything, it proves that Moses' law did an insufficient covering of blood. Right. It only sprinkled them, whereas the blood of Jesus washes sins away. Right. Right. Moses' law could not save us. Right. So this is not the scripture you definitely want to use, okay? Right. Um, and since we are to be covered with the blood of Jesus and our sins completely washed away, not just spot cleaned, okay, that's my terminology, okay? And according to Colossians 2, 11, and 12, we're supposed to be buried with him. It's a, it's a be buried with him. Jesus Christ didn't have, we're identifying with his burial, and it's not in here because we're going to deal with it tomorrow night, okay, because that's our text. But uh, but to be identified with his burial, you need to uh, you need to identify with his death that you repent and die to yourself. You need to be identified with his resurrection, receiving the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. But also you are buried with him in baptism, according to Colossians two eleven and twelve. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ they didn't lay him on top of the ground and sprinkle a little bit of dirt on him. <laughs> That's not what bury means. Not what baptism means. All right. You gonna follow me? So we're buried by going all the way under. Okay. So in short. Okay, let's wrap it up. There is no scriptural proof of the sprinkling of water for baptism in the New Testament. We should baptize by immersion today. means go all the way under because of many reasons. One, to follow the biblical pattern. That should be enough. Let's go home. Just kidding. Yes. Number two, to follow Christ's example. He was baptized by John the Baptist. The Bible says in the Gospels, who baptized the Jordan River because there was much water there. It would be easier to sprinkle them in Jerusalem. That's where the crowds were. They had to go all the way out to the Jordan River to be baptized because there was much water there. Think about that. Okay. Number three, to show respect for God's word. Number four, to preserve the significance of water baptism as a burial with Christ. And again, it's Colossians 2 and 12. And the other thing is, other methods come from non biblical tradition and for desires for convenience. And those are inadequate reasons to not fully obey the word of God. Okay? And so instead of trying to make what-if scenarios to skirt the rules, you need to obey the word of God. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, you need to get baptized in the name of Jesus Amen. by full immersion when you're old enough to know. Yes. Okay? Um... Uh, when uh, J.D. Anna received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, she received it quite young. I think she was six or seven, and she got it for real. But she was scared of water, deathly scared of water. J.D.'s always has gotten over it recently. As a young kid, she was scared of water. I can't tell you how many times I baptized her in, in practicing to get her into the baptistry. Mm -hmm. She knew she didn't get baptized. And she cried, I don't want to get baptized anybody. I'm scared of my head going into water. I said, well, I won't hold you in about 30 minutes. <laughs> I don't know why she was scared. I'm, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Uh, we would practice. We would practice in the pool, I practice, and she would say, well, Daddy, just say in G, I'd say, I baptize you in the name of practice. <laughs> and she would come up, we'd practice it, and she would say, well, just say in Jesus' name. We want the church to have to know. I said, no. I said, I said, you need, you need to not take the easy route on this. Right. And I said, I said, as an example to your friends, you need to show the importance of overcoming your fear and reacting to faith in this. It's not really a profession of your faith as far as publicly, but as a matter of being a preacher's kid and, and the fact it's a fearful thing, we're not just going to baptize you incognito. You need to do it. And so I wouldn't baptize her in Jesus' name in the pool. I baptized her many times, but that was fun. Okay. Um, you, you grasp what I'm saying there? Yes. In Ephesians 4 and 4, teaches us this. Where are we at? Our sister Dolores. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all Okay, one baptism. I say one baptism. One, one baptism. And that means that Paul believes there's only one correct way to be baptized according to Scripture. So in modern Christianity, there's many different baptisms. We'll baptize you this way. We'll baptize. There are some churches you can choose. 
I would tell you a church that you can choose your method of baptism or your formula is not a church based upon biblical principles but upon man-made tradition. Yes. You can choose? Is it Luby's Cafeteria? <laughs> <laughs> Pastor who doesn't have a fully conviction of doing things Bible, never looked at it? Do you really want to trust your soul to somebody who's never even bothered to look at something that Jesus commanded and, and the example of it in Scripture? It's a thought. Okay, I'm not being rude to them. I'm just yeah. saying, think about what you're doing. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Okay? And so I will only baptize one way, by full immersion, somebody who's old enough to profess, showing signs they have professed and believed in Jesus Christ, showing signs of repentance. And I'll baptize them by full immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. And I have never held anybody under, but there was one guy I thought about it. <laughs> and Daniel, if you're listening to this, you know who you are. All right. Bottom of page four. You guys okay? Yes. Take a deep breath. We've covered quite a bit of material. And um, uh, Sister Valda brought me these mega m &Ms. They are three times bigger peanuts and three times more chocolate. Check them babies out. <laughs> I tell my wife, but I only had one bag. <laughs> You're waiting me to hurry. I'm not going to hurry. I'm enjoying my imminent. <laughs> you okay about the sprinkling there? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> as long as it's not blood. <laughs> my dad was raised Methodist. There's some great Methodist people out there. My dad's one of them. He always says the Methodists filled the Holy Ghost. But when he got received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he got rebaptized in the name of Jesus by immersion. He was sprinkled as a young man. <laughs> now thank God for that, but he is still that in me that it's never too late to go forward. Right. Amen. Yes. Amen. Uh, my friend for the Vickers in Antlers, Oklahoma, of all places, baptized a 95-year-old man last year. Oh, wow. 95 years of age. In the name of Jesus. You want you want the fountain of youth? Be born again. He died he may have died five years old spiritually. And a hundred some of y'all get late. Never mind. Okay. Let's finish up tonight. All right, so let's talk about another one, okay? Christ did not send me to baptize. And this is, when people are really wanting to believe something, they'll go looking for a scripture like we talked about. They're looking, they say, I believe this, and this is a classic example of it. I believe this. Let's go look for scriptures that seem to go along with what I believe. And then let's rip that sucker out by the roots. Let's not read the scripture before or after. Let's not take it in context of the chapter. Let's pull that one verse, okay? And so this is definitely one. A favorite verse of uh, anti-baptism uh, people is when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and this is 1 Corinthians 1.17. We'll just read the verse, and we'll take it in context in a minute. Go ahead. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not for the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cost of Christ be emptied of its stone. All right. And so quoted this verse, the critic says, See, God did not send the Apostle Paul to baptize. Therefore, neither, neither should we, okay? And again, this is a classic example. You just took a verse, and we didn't read the verse before, the verse after. You have no idea what he's addressing. Right. You just found a verse that sounds, okay? So let's, let's, let's take a step. Before we actually take it in context, okay, let's, let's look at the facts that if you take that scripture, whatever Paul meant, if you take it to mean that Paul did not baptize people, well, then you have believed in untruth, okay? Which is a pleasant way of saying you believed a lie. Because the Apostle Paul baptized many people, right. okay? Um, on the top of page 5, you see the list? Everybody say, I see the list? I see, I see the, the list. list. Okay. <laughs> Acts 16, 14 through 15, uh, Lydia and her family were baptized by Paul. Uh, Acts 16, 31 through 33, the Philippian jailer, we already mentioned him. Uh, Acts 18 and 8, Crispus, he's the guy that invented fried chicken. You may have heard of him. Uh, that's not true, by the way. Uh, but what is true is that he was baptized, and him and many other Corinthians were baptized as a result of Paul's preaching. Uh, Acts 19, 1 through 7, Paul rebaptized the disciples of John the Baptist, which we mentioned. Acts 22, 16, Paul recounted how Ananias baptized him in his conversion, and he consented to it. Romans 6 and 3, Paul teaches the, the pastors in Rome the importance of baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul teaches on water baptism through typology of Moses crossing the Red Sea. Galatians 3, 27, Paul reminds the Galatian church they have been baptized into Christ, okay? Um, even, this is not all of them, this is just an example, okay? Um, even the preceding verse, if you look over on the back page, that was 1 Corinthians 1, 17 that he just read, right? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17, where he said, Paul said, Christ not sent me to baptize. Well, if you go back up a verse, 1 Corinthians 1, 16, this is what the verse before it says. 
It's you. I did not baptize also the household of Stephanus. 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 Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Okay, so he did baptize the household of Stephanus. Everybody say yay. Okay. So to realize what Paul was saying, when Paul says Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, what does he mean? Okay, so obviously it doesn't mean that Paul didn't baptize or believe in baptism because Paul did baptize and believe in baptism and taught people on it. Okay, what does it mean? So let's take it in context. So let's skip up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to skip back up to verse 10. Who gets the long one tonight? <laughs> you get it. And we're going to read all the way from verses 10 through 17. Here, here's a key thing. For those of you that are new, new, okay, here's a key thing, okay? The scriptures seem like it's contradicting something you know the Bible teaches elsewhere. Either go back up and read before it or keep reading. Right. It, it, it'll clarify itself. The Bible always clarifies itself. And this is a classic case. Let's skip back up six verses or so and go for it. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. There's always some Chloe's in the church. Go ahead. <laughs> what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another... I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Cephas, which is Simon Peter's nickname. Is. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? What's the, what's the, that's a rhetorical question. What's the answer to both questions? No. 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 Paul was not crucified for them, and they were not baptized into the name of Paul, even the ones Paul baptized. Go ahead. Okay. I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. And many forget he also baptized Stephanus. They don't want to offend him. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Okay, so in context, Paul was responding to a riff or an argument. I'm, I'm sure I'm, our church never has those, but I'm sure sometimes <laughs> um, that was grown within the Corinth church, okay? And what it did, it seemed, we're reading the answer, okay? So you've got to guess the question from the answer. But it sure seems that the Corinth church was making a big deal of who baptized them. Mm -hmm. And we're baptizing in the cliques based upon the person who actually performed their baptism, okay? And the point is, they had missed the point. That's the point, okay? Yeah. They missed, and as evidenced by Paul's rhetorical questions in verse 13, no, Paul was not crucified for them. No, they were not baptized under Paul's name. Now, Paul did baptize a few of them, but he says, you're not a part of Paul's group, okay? Now, let me pause for a moment, okay? Remember, we talked about last week that Jesus took the common Jewish practice of people being baptized by their teacher right. as a sign that I am submitting to their ways and I want to be identified by that teacher, okay? Um, and he took it and made it a part of the plan of salvation. He has the right to it. It's his, his salvation. He wrote it, okay? okay? But they took it one step further than he did, okay? And that is when Paul was baptizing, when Paul was bap there you go, baptizing someone, okay? Okay? He said, I baptize you not into Paul's name, which is what the Jewish teacher would have done in the time of Christ. Okay? He said, I baptize you into Jesus' name. I'm not making you a follower of me. I'm making you a follower of he. Right. You with me? Bad, bad English, but a good thought. Okay? It rhymes. Okay? So, right? You see what I'm saying? So they're arguing. Some were saying, well, well, I'm baptized by Apollos. He's a much better preacher than Paul. Okay. I'm baptized by the Apostle Paul. Well, I'm baptized by Cephas. Well, I don't remember who baptized me, but I'm, I'm under Christ. Okay? He's like, okay, you're missing the whole point. Y'all are getting divided up, okay, and nuking it out. And, when, and in that context, he says, he says, I, he says, Christ did not send me to baptize. What he means in that context is Christ did not send me to baptize people to identify with me in my ministry. Okay, Christ did send them to baptize, but what he meant was Christ didn't send them to, to identify, well, I'm Paul. It wasn't I was trying to get my group bigger than Apollos's. Or, right. So would that be like John's baptism? What do you mean? No, John baptized people repentance to look ahead to the Messiah. He just didn't have the name. But in the scripture, it says that I was baptized under John's 
baptism. Right, in Acts 19 is what you're praying. Yes. Right. They were baptized to be ready for the Messiah, but they never got around to being baptized in the Messiah's name. Right. So he rebaptized them in Acts 19, 1 through 6 in the name of Jesus, which is the Messiah. Right. What he's saying is, it wasn't to be like, I'm a follower of Paul versus Peter. Right. Christ didn't come get me to give some personal, you know, and in modern times, we have people that they're little, they're this is a horrible word. They're groupies of certain preachers. You know what I mean? Well, I'm I'm so and so. I follow so and same 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 exact thing. Okay. You know. Well, I want to be baptized by him. Okay. Well, that, you're missing the point. It doesn't matter who baptized you. It matters what name were you being baptized. Right. And 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 I'll, I'll just throw this out here. It's not in my notes, but I've also heard this. I've heard people say, well, the word baptism, literally in the Bible, means to immerse or to bury. Right. But figuratively it means to be identified with and I absolutely agree with that because the Jewish practice of identifying with a teacher okay right. but I've heard people say it means fig literally to immerse but figuratively to identify with so when it says baptize it means you just identify with Christ if you identify with Christ that, that's your baptism okay and I would say that okay the problem with that is is the disciples didn't believe that because they didn't say okay do you identify with Christ oh that was your baptism right. Right. they said no you need to be baptized kabloosh Right. You grasp what I'm saying? Right. Okay. You say, well, prove that. Well, Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, he, Philip's preached to him Christ, and he says, there's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Right. Right. If, if what he meant by baptism was just being identified as a believer of Christ, then why do they have to have water? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Obviously, yeah. the disciples actually. Are y'all with me? Yes. Okay, let's do one more thing. You might get out early. We've got 14 minutes. <laughs> baptism for the dead, or where I come from, the dead. <laughs> um, and so, again, you'll notice that both these are from Corinthians, okay? And let me just give, set, let me give you an example of why that is. In 1 Corinthians, you're reading the answer to a previous letter, which we don't have. You're reading the answer to the question, but you don't have the questions. It's Jeopardy. What is purple? Right. Okay. Never mind. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 15, 29, Paul makes another statement, which some people have built a whole honking doctrine on. Go ahead. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Ooh. Now, let's take a little poll. How many of you will admit you didn't know that was in the Bible until right now? You'll be honest. I got, I got, some, I got some hands going up. That, thank you for being honest, okay? Okay. Okay, if there's no resurrection, what will those two who are baptized for the dead? Okay, now, there is a, uh, there are some religious beliefs, okay? Uh, for example, the Church of Latter-day Saints, who you probably better know as the Mormons. You ever heard of the Mormons? Okay, they take that one scripture, rip it out by the roots, and they have built a whole doctrine on it where people are baptized for people who have already died. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, I went to Salt Lake City, which, of course, is the headquarters of the Mormon, uh, the church. They, they like to be called the Church of Latter-day Saints. And um, um, in the, when you enter the facility, there are certain parts of it you can enter. Let me put it that way. And you can see the you can see the big cathedral where the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, men on top of it, okay. And then you come around, you walk around, and you have a corner, and then there's this big room, and it's all these big ornate paintings of all these people that are important to Mormon tradition. I'm being very <laughs> polite. I'm being so stinking polite to be away. Uh, after the presidential debates, I don't have any <laughs> spirits out of me. But uh, the, uh, there's this big pool, like it basically like uh, it's like a big square pool. Uh, it's actually on a like stand. It kind of comes up, and I'll never forget the site. There are people lined up. I mean, there are people lined up forever, and they have lists in their hands. They have hands. If you've ever done any kind of genealogical research, how many of you ever done any genealogical research? Okay, you have used Mormon genealogical research because the Mormons have put millions of dollars into genealogical research because because they believe that you can go to Salt Lake City with a list of your ancestry and you can be baptized for them and they be saved, even though they've been dead for a long time. They believe in baptism for the dead. So it's great that all this genealogical research, okay, because you want to find out, for example, the, the Sibleys, you know, came from two brothers that came up from England uh, to Massachusetts. Uh, we found out all kinds of things about the Sibleys. I had one Sibley and invented the Sibley stove, which was used in the Civil War. Uh, very, very, I mean, it's very, people still use it for camping today. Uh, we had one that was the uh, governor of Massachusetts one time, a Sibley. We also had one that was hung for horse thievery. <laughs> uh, we have, 
We have a mixed Mix. past. <laughs> so um, that's great that Donald you like, but their motive behind it is that verse. Hmm. They believe. Are y'all with me? Yes. You learned something new tonight? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's well, good. Okay. okay. Um, and so before we look in the scripture, let's realize another truth, okay? Okay. The Bible says in the midst of two or three witnesses, let every word be established, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, that was Old Testament law, it's mentioned in New Testament, okay? Two or three words. If you've only got one verse of Scripture that you're building the whole doctrine on, and there's not another verse of Scripture that talks about it or another example of it, you don't have two or three witnesses, you, you're probably going out on a limb. Mm-hmm. Have, truth ha- always has three legs. I had a professor one time who had Legos, and he built a little steel. It was real nice. I wonder where he's going with this. The whole time he's talking, he's building Legos. Three legs. He says, truth always has three legs. And if you take one out, it falls over. If right. you only have one, you can't get the sucker to stand up. Okay? So that's very important. So what I want to say is there is no other scripture that ever mentions baptism for the dead. We never have an example of the apostles baptizing people. We never have people. In fact, the Jews trusted in their genealogical records because they felt like that because of the great blessings given to Abraham. We're almost done. Hang on me. Because of the great blessings given to Abraham, we felt like, uh, they felt like that if they could trace their lineage to prove they were direct descendants of Abraham, that they could live like the devil and trade in their wives for new models. The Pharisees did. To be a Pharisee, you had to have a direct lineage back to Abraham mm-hmm. to the point that, that uh, Herod got so sick of it that after the time of Christ, he destroyed all the Jewish genealogies. Right. So the last person who claimed to be the Christ of whom we have genealogies to prove he came from Abraham is Jesus the Christ from Nazareth. So, y'all with me here? Yes. Okay, so there's some cool things here, okay? And the Bible in the New Testament says not to trust in endless genealogies. It tells you not to go that route. Not, it's okay to find out if, you're, if your great-great-uncle was a horse thief, which we already knew. <laughs> but what he means is to trust it for salvation because you're connected to somebody. Right. Okay? All right? So there's never... If there's any other scripture about genealogies, it's that you shouldn't be obsessed with it right. or religious. Not that you should. Okay? And it's never, it's never found. Okay? And again, my faith doesn't work for you. Okay? Um, I can have faith for you to be healed physically, but not spiritually. Right. He that believes and is baptized right. shall be saved. And, and then the other thing is, is after a person dies, there is no scripture that gives them hope for that to change that status. <coughs> and, and before you say, well, that's horrible. No, that's actually a good thing. <laughs> Some of y'all missed it. <laughs> In other words, people say, well, you mean after they die, it's, it's done, they're either lost or saved? Yes, that's a yes. good thing. Yes. That means if you make it, you made it. Right. 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 Okay. Hebrews 9, 27, where are we at? And just as, it, it, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Okay. So it's appointed for man to die once. Y'all all hack it. Uh, and after that comes judgment. Some of y'all may die soon. Sounds like I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm being funny, okay? So <laughs> concepts like purgatory or a halfway house <laughs> between heaven and hell. That's horrible. I made this stuff up. Uh, uh, are inventions of men. They're never biblically found. Once you die, it's sealed, okay? Um, it's dangerous, illogical, and false doctrine to take one verse of Scripture and build an entire philosophical <coughs> concept, okay? So whatever Paul meant here, it's not that you can be baptized for the dead, okay? Mm-hmm. So let's, let's take it in context, okay? Let's finish up tonight's last thing. 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. Uh, who gets the big one? But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no re- resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Mm -hmm. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Okay. So this is the context. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter. Everybody say resurrection. Resurrection. And Paul is talking about, he's talking about people in court. We're raising at the end, so grasp this. That didn't believe that 
there would be a resurrection of the dead, that people would live again. And he was like, okay, if people can't get up in the future, then that means Christ didn't get up either. Right. Because he was the first fruits of the resurrection. Right. He was the, the foreshadowing of the great. And he's like, that's illogical, okay? And it's in that context, dealing with people who had weird religious beliefs, that he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, read it one more time. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? The dead are not raised at all. Why are people baptized for them? Okay, so what would Paul mean? Okay, I want you to understand something. There are some things in Scripture, not important things, but there are some things in Scripture where the answer is, we don't know. But we can guess, okay? And I'm sorry, but the Bible doesn't speak to this. It is, okay? But... One thing that pe some people believe, and I do not believe this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm gonna, I believe number two. So I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay? Number one is some people believe that Paul referred to those people when he said that those who are baptized for the dead, that Paul referred to those who became converts as the result of the deaths of Christian loved ones. The way the Greeks worded, and I have to admit that it could be a possibility. In other words, there were people who became Christians when their loved ones were martyred and gave their life. So they were baptized because of faith that they got from seeing them die. And the Greek can read that way. It's, it's, it's a possibility. Okay? I don't believe that, but it's a possibility. I have to admit it's a possibility. Okay? The second thing that could be, and this is what I believe, is that Paul referred to an errant doctrine believed by those whom he was confronting, and he was pointing out a contradiction in their own false belief. Okay? So basically, I'm dealing with Jason here, okay, who doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But I, as Paul, also know that Jason also believes in baptism for the dead. Okay? Doesn't mean that I believe in baptism of the dead, but I want to point out to him, if you don't believe in resurrection of the dead, then why are you also going to get baptized for the dead? Right. That doesn't even make sense. Right. Okay? False doctrine a lot of time contradicts itself. Right. Truth never contradicts itself. Right. right. Truth doesn't say we believe this, 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 and this. Oh, but actually this contradicts this, but we believe, well, <laughs> yeah. False doctrine. When you take stuff to the logical end, it contradicts itself, okay? Right. Right. So I believe that Paul was not saying, I believe in baptism for the dead, but some of you do, and yet some of you also are saying, you know, you've got family members that are arguing whether there's a resurrection of the dead, and then you're going out and saying people need to be baptized for the dead. Right. You people need to get realize you're contradicting yourself, okay? Yeah. That's a possibility of what he meant. I, that's what I believe, but it, it doesn't really matter, okay? Yeah. The third possibility <laughs> is that some preachers believe that Paul was referring to the baptism of the dead men. That, In other words, when you repent of your sins, you're identifying in Christ's death. The old man dies because you turn away from your sins. And when you're, when you're buried with Christ in baptism, you're identifying with his death. And he's talking about burying the dead man of the old sins. Possibility, I, that's, that's a little contrived, I think, for that passage. I think he's dealing with people who had all kind of false beliefs according to all of 1 Corinthians. Yeah, so right. I think he's just using their logic against them. But that's a possibility. I mean, I get it. Okay. I know sometimes we baptize live people. People that haven't repented, people that haven't really turned from their sins, and and and, it's, and that's why it's such a struggle to live for God because you're trying to bury somebody who's alive. Right, right, right. So, whichever the three, any of those makes better sense than taking that one verse and doing what the Mormons did, make a whole doctrine out of it. Okay. All right, let's finish up. We've got three minutes. Uh, we're going to redeem the time and stop way short of that. Uh, there's one verse of scripture that I would ask critics of water baptism to explain. We've covered pretty much every uh, argument against water baptism that I've ever heard in 40 years of reading, studying, talking to people. Um, if there's something that you've heard that we haven't covered in this previous lesson or in this lesson, please let me know. We'll add it in, and we'll have something for those last three minutes. Uh, there is uh, one verse of scripture. We're going to move on next week for water baptism, okay? Um, I would ask the critics of water baptism to explain. If people say, I don't believe in water baptism, and I always ask them, explain to me, what does the scripture mean, okay? Uh, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Go ahead. For there are three that testify the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. All right. So in the true believer's life, everybody say yay. Yeah, there yeah. are three things that agree in testimony that they're a believer. That's the context of the chapter. The spirit, the water, and the blood. If you're a true believer, you've got the testimony of all three in your life, testifying that you are a true believer, right? right. Anybody believe that? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, if you are seeking to obey the apostolic model, okay, and everything we've covered, this is pretty easy to explain. Mm -hmm. If you're a true believer, you've received the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. You've been baptized in water, yes. therefore the blood of Jesus has washed away your sins, according to Acts 22, 16. Pretty easy. Yes. You've got the witness of the Spirit, the witness of the water, and the witness of the blood. If you don't believe in the apostolic model, okay, 
If you just believe, I don't know, whatever, confessing your sins or whatever, okay, or just verbal belief, what does that mean? You have the witness of the Spirit? Where's the water? Right. What water is it talking about? Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. Okay. And obviously they shy away from that verse. But I'm just saying that it makes perfect sense in context of what the, the, the apostles taught. If you leave water baptism out, and if you try to say, well, I receive the Spirit when I believe, and the blood of Jesus when I repented, okay, where's the water? What's the water talking about? Why would he say that these three agree? Right. What's it, what's it referring to? There's no easy answer. I mean, they come up with them, but I mean, right. it's pretty obvious what he's talking about when you read the whole, the whole, the whole New Testament. Somebody say yay? yay. So to have the true testimony of God, you've got to have a testimony of the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And rather than searching for excuses and fanciful arguments to not obey God's word, why don't we get back to just simple obedience? Let's just do what God told us to do. It's pretty simple. Get in the water, name it. In the time, in the time we've talked about this, in the hour and fifteen minutes we spent tonight, I could have baptized every one of you four times. <laughs> Get in the water, just do it, okay? And let's read one last scripture, uh, Acts twenty-two sixteen, New Living Translation. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. All right. So. Uh, that's the that's the question. That's what the apostles would say. What do you what, what, Why are we talking about this? Get baptized. Amen. Hope you learned something. God bless you. Next week we're going to talk about uh, should a Christian keep the Sabbath. God bless you. In Jude, we find him writing in verse three. I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.